Lesson 3 Seeing People Through Jesus' Eyes Sabbath Afternoon, July 11 For three years and a half, the disciples were under the instruction of the greatest teacher the world has ever known. By personal contact and association, Christ trained them for his service. Day by day, they walked and talked with him, hearing his words of cheer to the weary and heavy laden, and seeing the manifestation of his power in behalf of the sick and the afflicted. Sometimes he taught them, sitting among them on the mountainside, sometimes beside the sea or walking by the way. He revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Wherever hearts were open to receive the divine message, he unfolded the truths of the way of salvation. He did not command the disciples to do this or that, but said, Follow me. On his journeys through country and cities, he took them with him, that they might see how he taught the people. They traveled with him from place to place. They shared his frugal fare, and like him, were sometimes hungry and often weary. On the crowded streets, by the lakeside, in the lonely desert, they were with him. They saw him in every phase of life. The Acts of the Apostles Page 17. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. The Ministry of Healing, page 143. How great is His love to us when He invites us to come to Him in all our afflictions, distresses, heartaches, and perplexities with the assurance that He will help us. He will bring health and brightness into our lives. If we place our hand in the hand of Jesus Christ, He will place our feet on solid rock, a better foundation than we ever had before. He will make us more strong in His strength, and He will work with all our efforts. Then, when our own souls have experienced His healing touch, we are brought into close fellowship with Jesus, and we will be laborers together with God, not only to restore the erring, to repair broken hearts and souls, but to impart courage and faith and confidence. This is the work of God's laborers, to bring to Jesus souls who have gone away from His direct teachings and have apparently gone to pieces on the rocks and reefs of sin. These broken lives, which have been apparently hopeless, he promises to make whole. The Upward Look, page 162. Sunday, July 12. The Second Touch. The Lord desires his people to arise and do their appointed work. The responsibility rests not upon the ministry alone. The lay members of the church are to share the burdens of soul-saving. The Lord now calls upon those who have a knowledge of the truth for this time to arouse from their lethargy and become true missionaries in His service. Time is short, and the Lord's work must be done without further delay. The Upward Look, page 60 We need more of Christ-like sympathy not merely sympathy for those who appear to us to be faultless, but sympathy for poor, suffering, struggling souls who are often overtaken in fault, sinning and repenting, tempted and discouraged. We are to go to our fellow men, touched, like our merciful high priest, with the feeling of their infirmities. Christian motives demand that we work with a steady purpose an undying interest, an ever-increasing importunity for the souls whom Satan is seeking to destroy. Nothing is to chill the earnest yearning energy for the salvation of the lost. Mark how all through the Word of God there is manifest the spirit of urgency of imploring men and women to come to Christ. 
we must seize upon every opportunity in private and in public, presenting every argument, urging every motive of infinite weight to draw men to the Savior. With all our power, we must urge them to look unto Jesus and to accept his life of self-denial and sacrifice. We must show that we expect them to give joy to the heart of Christ by using every one of his gifts in honoring his name. The Ministry of Healing, pages 164 and 165. We become too easily discouraged over the souls who do not at once respond to our efforts. Never should we cease to labor for a soul while there is one gleam of hope. Precious souls, cost our self-sacrificing Redeemer too dear a price to be lightly given up to the tempter's power. Without a helping hand, many would never recover themselves, but by patient, persistent effort, they may be uplifted. Such need tender words, kind consideration, tangible help. Christ is able to uplift the most sinful and place them where they will be acknowledged as children of God, joint heirs with Christ to the immortal inheritance. By the miracle of divine grace, many may be fitted for lives of usefulness. God's Amazing Grace, page 127. Our prayers are to be as earnest and persistent as was the petition of the needy friend who asked for the loaves at midnight. The more earnestly and steadfastly we ask, the closer will be our spiritual union with Christ. We shall receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. Our part is to pray and believe. Watch unto prayer. Watch and cooperate with the prayer hearing God. Bear in mind that we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. Monday, July 13. A Lesson in Acceptance. Jesus came in personal contact with men. He did not stand aloof and apart from those who needed his help. He entered the homes of men, comforted the mourner, healed the sick, aroused the careless, and went about doing good. And if we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we must do as he did. We must give men the same kind of help that he did. The Lord desires that His word of grace shall be brought home to every soul. To a great degree, this must be accomplished by personal labor. This was Christ's method. His work was largely made up of personal interviews. He had a faithful regard for the one-soul audience. Through that one soul, the message was often extended to thousands. There are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. My Life Today Page 227. Christ in his teaching dealt with men individually. It was by personal contact and association that he trained the twelve. It was in private, often to but one listener, that he gave his most precious instruction. To the honored rabbi at the night conference on the Mount of Olives, to the despised woman at the well of Sychar, he opened his richest treasures. For in these hearers, he discerned the impressible heart, the open mind, the receptive spirit. Even the crowd that so often thronged his steps was not to Christ an indiscriminate mass of human beings. He spoke directly to every mind and appealed to every heart. He watched the faces of his hearers, marked the lighting up of the countenance, the quick responsive glance, which told that the truth had reached the soul and there vibrated in his heart the answering chord of sympathetic joy. Christ discerned the possibilities in every human being. He was not turned aside by an unpromising exterior or by unfavorable surroundings. He called Matthew from the toll booth and Peter and his brethren from the fishing boat to learn of him. The same personal interest, the same attention to individual development are needed today. Education pages 231 and 232. The tender sympathies of our Savior were aroused for fallen and suffering humanity. If you would be his followers, you must cultivate compassion and sympathy. 
Indifference to human woes must give place to lively interest in the sufferings of others. The widow, the orphan, the sick and the dying will always need help. Here is an opportunity to proclaim the gospel, to hold up Jesus, the hope and consolation of all men. When the suffering body has been relieved and you have shown a lively interest in the afflicted, the heart is opened and you can pour in the heavenly balm. If you are looking to Jesus and drawing from him knowledge and strength and grace, you can impart his consolation to others because the Comforter is with you. Councils on Health, page 34. Tuesday, July 14. Begin where you are. Christ told his disciples that they were to begin their work at Jerusalem. In Jerusalem were many who secretly believed Jesus of Nazareth to be the Messiah, and many who had been deceived by priests and rulers. To these the gospel must be proclaimed. They were to be called to repentance, the wonderful truth that through Christ alone could remission of sins be obtained was to be made plain. And it was while all Jerusalem was stirred by the thrilling events of the past few weeks that the preaching of the disciples would make the deepest impression. The Acts of the Apostles, page 31. Andrew found his brother and called him to the Savior. Philip was then called, and he went in search of Nathanael. These examples should teach us the importance of personal effort, of making direct appeals to our kindred, friends, and neighbors. There are those who for a lifetime have professed to be acquainted with Christ, yet who have never made a personal effort to bring even one soul to the Savior. There are many who need the ministration of loving Christian hearts. Many have gone down to ruin who might have been saved if their neighbors, common men and women, had put forth personal effort for them. Many are waiting to be personally addressed. In the very family, the neighborhood, the town where we live, there is work for us to do as missionaries for Christ. If we are Christians, this work will be our delight. No sooner is one converted than there is born within him a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. The Desire of Ages, page 141. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. These words of Jesus have lost none of their force. Our Savior calls for faithful witnesses in these last days of religious formalism. But how few, even among the professed ambassadors for Christ, are ready to give a faithful personal testimony for their Master. Many can tell what the great and good men of generations past have done and dared and suffered and enjoyed. But while so earnest in bringing forward other Christians as witnesses for Jesus, they seem to have no fresh, timely experience of their own to relate. What have you to say for yourselves? What soul conflicts have you experienced that have been for your good, for the good of others, and for the glory of God? You who profess to be proclaiming the last solemn message of mercy to the world, what is your experience in the knowledge of the truth, and what has been its effect upon your own hearts? Does your character testify for Christ? Can you speak of the refining, ennobling, sanctifying influence of the truth as it is in Jesus? What have you seen? What have you known of the power of Christ? This is the kind of witness for which the Lord calls, and for lack of which the churches are suffering. Gospel Workers Page 273 Wednesday, July 15 Dealing with Difficult People Study the history of Joseph and of Daniel. The Lord did not prevent the plottings of men who sought to do them harm, but he caused all these devices to work for good to his servants who amidst trial and conflict preserved their faith and loyalty. So long as we are in the world, we shall meet with adverse influences. There will be provocations to test the temper, and it is by meeting these in a right spirit that the Christian graces are developed. If Christ dwells in us, we shall be patient, kind, and forbearing. 
cheerful amid frets and irritations. Day by day and year by year we shall conquer self and grow into a noble heroism. This is our allotted task, but it cannot be accomplished without help from Jesus, resolute decision, unwavering purpose, continual watchfulness, and unceasing prayer. Each one has a personal battle to fight. Not even God can make our characters noble or our lives useful unless we become co-workers with Him. Those who decline the struggle lose the strength and joy of victory. The Ministry of Healing, page 487 The love which should exist between church members frequently gives place to criticism and censure, and these appear even in the religious exercises, in reflections and severe personal thrusts. Such things should not be countenanced by ministers, elders, or people. The services of the church should be carried forward with an eye single to the glory of God. When men, with their peculiar organizations, are brought together in church capacity, unless the truth of God softens and subdues the sharp points in the character, the church will be affected and its peace and harmony sacrificed to indulge these selfish, unsanctified traits. Many in their close watch to discover the faults of their brethren neglect the investigation of their own hearts and the purification of their own lives. This brings the displeasure of God. The individual members of the church should be jealous for their own souls, critically watching their own actions, lest they should move from selfish motives and be a cause of stumbling to their weak brethren. God takes men as they are with the human element in their character and then trains them for His service if they will be disciplined and learn of Him. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 488 and 489. The life of Christ established a religion in which there is no caste, a religion by which Jew and Gentile, free and bond, are linked in a common brotherhood, equal before God. He passed by no human being as worthless, but sought to apply the healing remedy to every soul. In whatever company he found himself, he presented a lesson appropriate to the time and the circumstances. Every neglect or insult shown by men to their fellow men only made him more conscious of their need of his divine human sympathy. He sought to inspire with hope the roughest and most unpromising, setting before them the assurance that they might become blameless and harmless, attaining such a character as would make them manifest as the children of God. The Ministry of Healing, pages 25 and 26. Thursday, July 16. Sensing Providential Opportunities If the Lord desires us to bear a message to Nineveh, it will not be as pleasing to Him for us to go to Joppa or to Capernaum. He has reasons for sending us to the place toward which our feet have been directed. At that very place, there may be someone in need of the help we can give. He who sent Philip to the Ethiopian consular, Peter to the Roman centurion, and the little Israelitish maiden to the help of Naaman, the Syrian captain, sends men and women and youth today as his representatives to those in need of divine help and guidance. The Ministry of Healing, page 473. Heavenly angels watch those who are seeking for enlightenment and cooperate with those who try to win souls to Christ. This is shown in the experience of Philip and the Ethiopian. A heavenly messenger was sent to Philip to show him his work for the Ethiopian. Angels of God were taking notice of this seeker for light. Today, as then, angels are leading and guiding those who will be led and guided. The angel sent to Philip could himself had done the work for the Ethiopian, but this was not God's way of working. As God's instruments, men must work for others. When God pointed out to Philip his work, the disciple did not say, as many are saying today, God does not mean that. I will not be too confident, or I shall make a mistake. Philip that day learned a lesson of conformity to God's will that was worth everything to him. 
he learned that every soul is precious in the sight of God and that angels will bring light to those who are in need of it. Through the ministration of angels, God sends light to his people, and through his people, this light is to be given to the world. In Heavenly Places, page 103. In the experience of Philip and the Ethiopian is presented the work to which the Lord calls his people. The Ethiopian represents a large class who need missionaries like Philip, missionaries who will hear the voice of God and go where he sends them. There are those in the world who are reading the scriptures, but who cannot understand their import. The men and women who have a knowledge of God are needed to explain the word to these souls. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 58. He whose heart is filled with the grace of God and love for his perishing fellow men will find opportunity wherever he may be placed to speak a word in season to those who are weary. Christians are to work for their master in meekness and lowliness, holding fast to their integrity amid the noise and bustle of life. We should strive to understand the weakness of others. We know little of the heart trials of those who have been bound in chains of darkness and who lack resolution and moral power. God's Amazing Grace, page 127. For further reading, Testimonies for the Church, Effect of Discussions, Volume 3, page 217, and The Acts of the Apostles, The Gospel in Samaria, pages 103 to 111.